At last, after all these days of travel and hardship, we have found the target of our quest. How can you be sure this is the thing? It's glowing! Hi folks, welcome to Glitter Void Gamecraft. My name is Eric, and today I am building a mysterious ruined place of power with a floating stone obelisk, and of course, glowing runes. I use and mispronounce the word versatile on this channel a lot, but I don't think anything is really quite as versatile to you as a dungeon master as something like this piece. Whether it's starting quests, ending quests, looking for a quest giver, looking for information, stumbling across a random encounter somewhere in the forest, or not too far in the forest, this is the place where it's going to happen. And how do you know it's mysterious? glowing runes. On top of its usefulness, this is an incredibly easy build to make. Other than one tiny thing, I didn't use a ruler once throughout this. So if you're looking to get started, this is the thing to do it on. Did I mention the glowing runes? Towards the end of the video, I'm going to give you some ideas on ways to play with this and build encounters using a piece of terrain like this. I'm also going to show you how to do the glowing runes, but for now, let's get crafting. The place of power is meant to be a truly ancient location, hundreds or even thousands of years older than the nearest town. It'll sit on a large elliptical base with some small elevation changes and a large rock formation sticking out of the ground. A natural dais with a small crater will serve as a foundation for a floating rock, a rough tear-shaped obelisk. The obelisk will be set into the crater which will help hide the invisible support and will be dressed up with some sort of carved rune. A glowing effect on the runes will give it a mystical, otherworldly look, and a cave opening at the backside of the large rock formation will provide an optional dungeon entrance. The look will be finished off with some waystones and a removable rough-hewn altar. For the base, I decided to try using regular cardboard. You can reuse packaging material, but if you haven't recently ordered something large enough, you can always buy moving boxes. I traced an outline and sketched in the other layers just to get an idea of how the whole thing would look. I cut the base out with a utility knife, adding a little bit of waviness to the edges to make it look more natural. I didn't do too much waviness on the bottom layer because I was worried about sharp edges on the bottom layer getting bumped around on the table. The second layer was done in the same way, making a small indent for the cave entrance, and the rock layer was cut from XPS insulation foam. I hacked away chunks, forming it into a rough circle. No need to be too precise here, as it'll get roughened up even more in a moment. I didn't want to just use the foil ball to texture the platform edges, I wanted more dramatic textures. I carved vertical strips using my knife. I varied the angle and depth of the cuts and overlapped them to keep them from looking too uniform. Further detail was added by just grabbing the sharp edges and ripping chunks out. Then I went back in with my trusty ball of foil to add the stone texture, also making sure to soften all the harsher angles. I didn't bother going all the way to the center of the top as I was going to carve it out into a crater. I used some corner scraps I cut off earlier to form the entrance to the cave, adding some textures to the outward facing bits. Any gaps will be hidden when I add more rocks later. All of the base materials were attached using hot glue. Besides the strength and speed at which it dries, using a cardboard base means watching out for too much moisture, even more so than usual. I didn't worry too much about glue glooping out. Dressing this up with rocks and flocking later will hide any mess. I wanted to try a bit of an experiment in creating the transition between the two levels. I glued a bunch of hot glue along the seam and smoothed out using a scrap of foam. This both saves my fingers from getting burned and allows me to move lots of hot glue around quickly. The idea is to form a slope for a smooth transition and also to hide the visible cardboard edge. I actually didn't do this all the way around because I started to think that glue and ground cover would be enough. Spoiler alert, my first idea was way better and would have saved me hours of drying time if I did the whole thing like this. Using 1 inch thick XPS foam, I cut a flattened teardrop shape for the obelisk. I hacked out a rough shape and then sliced off the corners, gradually rounding the shape. 
I also took a small layer off the factory finished side to remove the shiny part and to roughen up the surface. I checked regularly against the terrain piece to make sure it was still a good size and eventually had a passable obelisk. I cut chips and grooves into the surface and textured the whole thing with the ball of foil. Now that I had the obelisk size figured out, I marked and cut out the crater. I cut most of the main hole out using a utility knife and pulled out the bits with pliers. Most of the inside of the crater won't be visible, so I wasn't so concerned with super clean cuts. I sliced in a few larger cracks using an X-Acto knife and kept working at it until I was happy with the depth and detail of the crater. Adding sharp rocks at the top of the cave entrance helped to break up sight lines around the obelisk and make it all feel more imposing. I textured up some more wedge scraps and stuck them together using toothpicks. To keep too much glue from getting everywhere, I covered the roof of the cave entrance with hot glue to fuse everything together, which is a very hard maneuver to film with a static overhead camera and only two hands. Further gaps were filled with rocks cut out of foam and hot glued in place. The dais was a little high in comparison to a standard miniature, so I made some rough stairs from XPS foam, making sure they looked more like stacked stones rather than hewn stairs. Leftovers from this process, isn't recycling great, were made into smaller waste stones, just some piles of circular rocks supporting an approximately cylindrical stone with a pointy top. I decided to try texturing them with the rocks in Tupperware as I've done in other videos, but the textures were pretty subtle. I'm not sure if my XPS foam is different than the foam core board, or maybe it's because it was nearly midnight and I didn't want to make too much noise shaking it. It also broke one of the thinner parts, so I retextured everything with the foil instead. I glued the bases to the ground with hot glue and attached the taller rocks with toothpicks and glue. Any pieces that are this small and tall and out in the open are at risk of getting snapped off when moving or storing, so reinforcement is a must. Since I wanted the altar to have a similar rough hewn look as everything else, I dove into my scrap pile again, shaping bits into a rough circle and giving them chips, cracks, and the usual stone texture. I decided to go with two supports rather than a single central base in order to allow victims slash summon creatures to ascend slash descend the stairs. I glued them together using hot glue, but noticed that the center of the two support design was a little bit weaker. I inserted some toothpicks in the supports and a piece of popsicle stick under the top of the table to reinforce it. Once the glue had dried, I snipped the bottoms of the toothpicks and filed them smooth. I prepped the ground for sand by slathering the base with PVA glue spreading it out with a brush and making sure to press it up to and over the edges of the rock. This gives the impression that the rocks are coming out of the ground rather than just sitting on top of them. I scattered a liberal amount of sand over everything and left it to dry overnight. This forms a rock hard covering with a slight variation due to the different amounts of glue here and there. Unfortunately, the transition between the two levels wasn't hidden enough for my taste. I thought it would be a fast fix by putting more glue and sand to cover up the corrugation, but even this settled before drying and didn't really hide the edge. A third application of glue and sand was required, this time with tacky glue, to hold it in place better. This finally worked. Next time I'm definitely hiding the transition with hot glue. If I had done this from the start, I would have likely completely hidden the transition during the first application of glue and sand, saving me about half a day of drying time. I then scattered some small gravel around, securing it with white glue near the foam and super glue everywhere else, as the super glue will melt the foam. I needed to hide the ugly cardboard edge on the lowest level of the base. Using some printer cardstock, thicker than paper but thinner than food packaging, I cut strips as wide as the cardboard was deep, covering it all the way around the base. I glued it on with hot glue, being careful not to burn myself too much. You can use PVA glue, but the effort and time needed to babysit it before it will stick is way more effort than I was willing to put in. One final detail before painting, carving the runes into the obelisk and the altar. I alternated the angles of my cuts and removed the material inside. Using a sharp blade helps to avoid tearing the foam. You can get inspired and maybe learn something by looking at all sorts of different sources. Norse runes, Egyptian hieroglyphs, Sumerian pictographs, Adinkra symbols. Everything got a coat of Mod Podge mixed with black acrylic ink. Mixed up the new batch, trying something new. This seals the sand to the base and hardens the foam, which is especially useful with all of the rough, 
fragile edges from the large stone texture. There were a few small places in between details that my large brush couldn't reach, so I used a thin, long bristled brush and Vallejo surface primer to get at them. I decided to go a bit wild with the stone color. I've seen other crafters do a blue-gray base coat and wanted to try a more intense version, thinking it would look good with what I planned to do with the glowing runes. I applied blue mixed with a touch of black to all the stone. Once it dried, I saw that it didn't darken as much as I expected, and it made me very nervous. I did a super heavy overbrush of dark gray over the Muppet blue, probably heavier than I meant to. I was trying to hide the bright blue poking out of the deepest recesses. I highlighted with a dry brush of light gray, which made the sharp edges of the hand cut stones really pop, though there was still a concerning amount of blue showing through. Hopefully the washes will come through for me again. I base coated the ground with a dark brown, and then I splotched on a dark green in patches. This was to help make the patches of grass flocking look less stark by smoothing some of the transitions between brown dirt and the raised grass. Everything got a coat of my homemade black wash, including patches on the ground to add more variety. I have to say, for the first time, I am underwhelmed with how the wash performed. I expected the blue to come out a dingy blue-gray, but it was still very blue. I may have to go back in with some spots of a darker wash if the highlights don't fix the issue. For now, I continued on with a dry brush of suede. This looked especially nice on the sharp edges of the obelisk, making it look almost like a giant arrow or spearhead. For ground cover, I chopped up some hemp cord and mixed it with some static grass flocking. I'll use this in addition to the fine turf foam flock to give it different textures. I spread out patches of PVA glue, trying to make them more random and less blobbish, a nitpick I've had on a few of my last terrain projects. I dusted on the fine turf and let it dry overnight and knocked off the excess. To try to save some time drying, I decided to merge two steps, adding the second round of flocking and sealing it all in. I dribbled a mixture of rubbing alcohol and water and sprayed on diluted PVA glue. On top of this, I sprinkled the static grass flock. I was hoping that this was a thin and absorbent enough flock that it would soak up enough of the glue mixture and I wouldn't need to reseal everything once it dried. And it was. This stuff isn't going anywhere. Now for the nerve wracking part, object source lighting, or making the paint look like the object is the source of some light. That's pretty straightforward, actually. I like to work from brightest to darkest. To me, it feels easier to correct mistakes. I loaded up a pretty fine brush and lined all of the grooves of the runes with a pure white. Don't go crazy, but you don't have to be super perfect here. A little overflow is easy to correct. For the larger glow inside the crater, I overbrushed the white on the very bottom of the obelisk and the deepest part of the crater. Then I moved on to a dry brush of aqua making a gentle transition from the white to aqua and fading the glow out as it got further from the source. On the runes, I just did a general dry brush around each one, trying to avoid getting the bristles with aqua on it inside the grooves to keep the core color as bright as possible. I then went back and did a solid edge highlight, basically just a thin line of pure aqua, on all the edges of the symbols, as those edges would catch the most light from the interior glow. This effect worked even better than I hoped, and under all the lights in my workspace, it looked downright fluorescent. For final details, I added some bushes using a store-bought clump foliage, but you could easily make it from torn-up kitchen sponges. I attached these with PVA glue and later soaked them in the diluted PVA glue mixture. I did some final highlights on the stone in white, focusing on the sharpest edges and highest points of the stone, and a bright green highlight on the tops of the larger clumps of grass. Then it was outside to seal the whole thing with a spray-on matte varnish. To attach the obelisk, I jabbed in a toothpick covered in PVA glue. I painted it white so it would be hidden in the glow and glued it in place. Whatever colors you use, make sure you match so the toothpick disappears and creates the illusion of floating. And voila! A floating obelisk place of power with object source lighting for a mysterious inner glow. Whether this is a mystical site hidden in a primeval forest, or a little-used site of worship closer to the town, 
this is a great target for adventure. Once it dried, the obelisk was actually a lot weaker than I would have liked, but it fits so good that I couldn't get snippers down in to cut the support to redo it, and I don't want to risk yanking it out and tearing away a huge chunk of foam. For now, I'll leave it, and if slash when it breaks, I'll redo the support with two to three more toothpicks. When the ancient runes appear, or change, or begin to glow, who better to call to investigate than a wandering band of lovable adventures slash murder hobos? Heck, as the dungeon master, you don't even need to know why this is happening to start an adventure and have some creepy antagonists show up and try to thwart the party. The cave is a convenient shelter for a quest giver or an entrance to a large subterranean dungeon, and the movable altar is always versatile. Sacrifices or summoning rituals can create portals to new areas or summon dangerous monsters to lay waste to the party. The runes say... Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Hmm. Well, now that we're all aglow from that build, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, consider giving it a thumbs up and letting me know in the comments if this recipe for object source lighting works for you or other ways that you've managed to achieve this effect. If you found anything particularly useful, why not subscribe to the channel or share it with a friend or your dungeon master? That all really helps me out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Oh, what do you mean it doesn't glow in the dark? <laughs>